Hello everyone, my name is Sebastian, and I'm one of the co-founders of Pima Studios, and we're a game studio that has created multiple games, as well as we're the authors of Pima Engine, one of the largest sovereign roll-up projects in all of crypto. It's a roll-up framework we've written from scratch. Uh, you might know us because we wrote Tarochi, which is an on-chain RPG game that was the first app deployed to Arbitrum Orbit's Layer 3 stack, and notably we were the first app deployed to the first Orbit chain, which is Xi, which is a Orbit a Layer 3 for Arbitrum that is optimized for gaming. So why are we making this video? Well, since Arbitrum Orbit uh, launched a few months ago, and Xi was the first Layer 3 created there, there's now over 40 Arbitrum Orbit chains, and there's probably going to be a lot more coming uh, very fast. And so us as a game studio, this poses a problem because we want to attract as many users and collaborate with as many IP partners as possible to create a vibrant game ecosystem, and the creation of all these Orbit chains, to a certain extent, does fracture the user base. And so we've been working on an initiative to try and solve this at the rollup level. So we're the authors of Pima Engine, which is a rollup framework optimized for creating uh, decentralized games like Torochi um, and other games we've been working on. And so we've been working to try and allow games to leverage multiple orbit chains together, leverage Arbitrum, leverage other layer twos and other layer ones together, all in the same gaming experience. So how have we accomplished this? Well, it's something we've been working towards for multiple months. And so if you go to the Pima Engine GitHub repo, this is the name of our rollup framework, you can find many releases where we're slowly adding more and more features to this. And we just finished unifying all our parallel funnel architecture to allow for exactly this functionality. So what does that actually mean in practice? So this is these are the docs, the documentation for Pima Engine. And first, let's take a step back and talk about what Pima Engine is and why do we create this rollup framework optimized for the new modular era. So right now, historically, most uh, layer twos have been built by monitoring a single blockchain. For example, Arbitrum Orbit, uh, sorry, Arbitrum One is a layer two for Ethereum. What does that mean? It means Arbitrum One has its own, uh, you know, blocks, its own block producer, and its own transactions. But it occasionally submits um, all the rollup state and all the data to the Ethereum layer one protocol. But also, when you go from Ethereum layer one to Arbitrum one, you create a transaction on Ethereum that syncs that state. And so to know these bridge requests and know when to go from when people are trying to go from layer one to layer two, Arbitrum one actually monitors Ethereum and monitors their rollup contract and checks whenever new things are happening on that rollup contract, be it people bridging to layer two, be it people submitting fraud proofs or whatever else might happen. And so that's how uh, layer twos got started. Uh, but nowadays we're seeing the growth of two layer, I uh, sorry, two chain layer twos. So for example, a layer two that might monitor Ethereum and Celestia. So they're synchronizing two different blockchains to get a full state for their rollup. Ethereum for the uh, checkpoints, if you will, and Celestia for the data. So basically whenever somebody uh, submits a hash, um, a commitment on Ethereum, they also submit all the data to Celestia. And then you, if you're running a rollup node, you need to get the commitments from Ethereum so you know what is the true state of the rollup and then the data from Celestia to know what data those commitments correspond to. And so we've seen the growth of these two chain layer twos. And uh, for gaming, we see this as going even more extreme. Why? Because for games, you really need to leverage multiple things. You need to leverage EVM for the user base and the existing applications. You might need to leverage other protocols um, that maybe don't uh, maybe provide functionality that's not available inside Ethereum. Uh, so for example, you might want to leverage a ZK layer to get access to ZK proofs to help scale your game. You might want access to DA layers for faster and cheaper access to um, large amounts of data. You might want to leverage other layer one protocols that don't have the same downsides or upsides as, as EVM. So you might want to leverage you know, Solana and Cardano or the SUI or Aptos or Algorand or all these other uh, blockchains out there. And so if you're trying to build a game that's leveraging all these different stacks, it's really hard to build your application, having to learn and master all these different technical frameworks. And so our goal at Pima Engine is to allow you to create an app chain, an application specific rollup that aggregates the state of all these different stacks together and provides you a single state machine that you can write your application to and automatically aggregate um, state from all these different blockchains and build a unified application. So the way that works from a configuration perspective is that when you create your, your rollup with Pima Engine, you specify a configuration file saying, okay, I'm going to create a rollup and I want to have some primary EVM network that I'm using for my chain. 
Uh, and then I also want to have some other Ethereum network that I'm, I'm seeing. So this, for example, that might be XI and Arbitrum. And then we support multiple other uh, layer one protocols. We have support for Cardano, we have support for Mina, for ZK, we have upcoming support for Abale, and we have some other partial support for Algorand and Polkadot as well. So we support quite a lot of different uh, stacks inside PyMagin already. And so from PyMagin, you specify all these different, you know, configuration files for which uh, blockchains you want to leverage. And then next, you specify some uh, primitives using our primitive catalog. So what are primitives? Primitives are the way for you to specify what features you want to use from these different blockchains you're monitoring. So for example, for EVM, we support ERC20 tokens, 721, 6551, 1115. We also support factory patterns, EVM logs, and a whole bunch of other things. And so inside your configuration file, you say, okay, I am monitoring, for example, uh, I can see right here. I'm monitoring, for example, uh, this hard hat network. And inside the hard hat network, there's a specific contract address. And I want to monitor this ERC20 that's deployed at that contract address. So whenever people uh, move that ERC20 token, whenever new ERC20 tokens get minted or whatever that might be, update the rollup state. Have an actual state transition function on the rollup side to update your game, update your application based on what happened on this network. And so that's how we allow developers to basically create a single state machine that is monitoring multiple different uh, networks and updating their rollup state, their virtual view of the whole uh, you know, uh, state um, just based off these events happening without having to learn all these different stacks, having to learn all these different standards, they can just create um, these kind of configuration files and then start getting to work on their actual state machine. And so, uh, of course, this is great in theory, uh, but if you're a blockchain developer, you might have already had noticed uh, things are not that simple. So what happens? So uh, first, um, you know, you have your block from, for example, Xi. If you're monitoring Xi as your main chain for your game, you then uh, can merge in data from, for example, Arbitrum. And then you create a virtual block, which is the resulting data from the aggregation of, of all these different chains you're monitoring. But what happens about determinism, right? If you're creating a decentralized application, it means anybody should be able to run their own node and reach the same final state. So for example, anybody can run their own Ethereum node, anybody can run their own Arbitrum node, anybody can run their own side node. And so everybody needs to agree on the final result. So we need determinism. So how do we achieve determinism if you're monitoring multiple blockchain? So the way we do this is that we look at the timestamp of the main chain and then include any blocks on the uh, parallel chains, the other chains you're monitoring, if they've happened between the timestamp of the previous block and the timestamp of the current block. So for example, on Xi, you might have a block at time one, block at time three, a block at time five, block at time seven. So these are different timestamps. So once you reach the block at time three, uh, we say, okay, well, uh, now that I've reached block time three on Xi, let's include any block of time uh, three or smaller that happened on Arbitrum. And there is one, there's one that happened at block two. So you include these two together into a single virtual block that aggregates these states. So you'd have, uh, you know, here in red, you'd have Xi, uh, that's your Xi block. Uh, down here, you'd have your Arbitrum block, and then the result would be a virtual block that aggregates the states from these two different states. So then if you have a block at timestamp five, you're aggregating the block at from Arbitrum at timestamp four and the block at timestamp five. And so you now have a virtual block that contains uh, these three things together. So this is great, because now you can have this kind of determinism but uh, there's another problem that, that comes up with this, which is how do you ensure that the results that you've aggregated does not change later? And so blockchains have a concept of finality, which is when are we guaranteed the data will no longer change that we're certain about the result. So for example, on Ethereum, on the layer one, blocks are not guaranteed to stay around forever. There might be short-term rollbacks where a block that was part of the blockchain gets excluded and then new block gets replaced. This also happens on, for example, Bitcoin. So on Bitcoin, usually people say you need about six blocks to consider something final. And that's why if you ever send funds to an exchange, the exchange will usually ask you to wait, you know, an hour or two, especially for Bitcoin, because it's waiting for the finality, waiting for that to make sure that data can no longer change. And after an hour or two has passed, then it's guaranteed to be immutable. And so for our system, we need to consider finality. We need to make sure that to maintain determinism, uh, we avoid any rollbacks and we only include uh, data into our game if it really is finalized. This is, even, this is maybe not as much of a problem for DeFi, but it's especially important for games because imagine you're playing a game, 
it's a competitive game, maybe a shooter or whatever, and you're in some epic battle, and suddenly the game stops and says, oh wait, there's a rollback, like undo that battle. Uh, yeah, that was actually, th that never happened. Like this is a really, really bad user experience uh, for games. So we really want to avoid this. So how do we handle finality? Well, we can't just use the system we used, we showed here. We say, okay, we'll include a block of the previous timestamp into uh, the virtual block because um, this, uh, you know, parallel chain itself, that block might get rolled back. It might disappear. Okay. And what's even worse is that even if you don't consider uh, potential rollbacks, you also have to consider network lag, right? If you're synchronizing multiple blockchains, you have multiple blocks you're trying to include into your application, it might just be that your network is slow, right? Maybe you just haven't downloaded that block yet from the uh, internet, right? Uh, from your, your peers on the peer-to-peer -peer network. And so how do we tackle this? Well, the first way, uh, the first insight for how we tackle this is that we wait until there's multiple blocks made to know we didn't miss anything, right? So exactly what we're talking about. Um, so here you can see that uh, from our computer, we see we're monitoring, you know, for example, Xi up here, maybe Arbitrum here, maybe another a blockchain or maybe another Orbit stack uh, down here. So we see in Xi, we found a block. In Arbitrum, we found a block. And not only have we found a block, it happens after the Xi block. And so if we assume Arbitrum 1 has instant finality, um, then we're good to go. We know there's no data we've missed here. We've already found everything. But here, for example, on this other uh, chain, uh, we found a block, but there might be another block right afterwards that we just, you know, haven't seen yet. Uh, we just haven't made that network request. We haven't seen it into our and peers yet. And so we can't say that this block up here is finalized. There might still be data missing. In fact, it's not even enough to say that we need to find a block with the same timestamp because in Arbitrum Orbit, for example, you might have multiple blocks at the same timestamp because uh, timestamps are in seconds. And so there might be multiple blocks in the same Second, because um, blocks in Arbitrum Orbit are usually around 215 milliseconds. So you might have multiple blocks at the same timestamp. So you're not guaranteed there's not, there's not another block you just haven't seen uh, down here um, that you just, just by luck because of your network, you haven't seen it yet. So you really need to wait until you found a block after your timestamp, after the Xi block timestamp, to know that, okay, uh, these two are finalized. We know there's blocks coming afterwards. We know these blocks are final, and so we're good to go. So this helps avoid um, finality issues due to network um, lag. But note, as I mentioned, that some networks um, take a while for finality to happen. So for example, Ethereum, uh, you know, might take a minute, blockchain might take, uh, sorry, Bitcoin might take hours. So it really depends on which blockchain you're using, um, how fast you can get this finality. And you don't want waiting for finality to really slow down your game. Um, like you can imagine here, uh, if we hadn't had the system, you know, as soon as we got the side block, we'd be good to go, ready to update the game, go to the next step. But now we're saying, okay, actually the game has to wait to update because we have to wait for another new block to happen later. So the difference here actually causes a slowdown in the game state updating, and really, we really don't want that. So to tackle this, we have this concept we introduced called delayed state, which has two parameters, confirmation depth and delay. So confirmation depth first specifies how many blocks after you need to wait for. So here, you know, we have this configured at, you know, uh, zero or one, which is like, okay, we just wait for the next block and then we're good to go. Uh, if you're using something like Bitcoin, for example, you might say, okay, well, let's just assume after six blocks is okay. So we need to wait um, not only for the next block, we need to wait, you know, for, uh, you know, five or six blocks after that um, before we consider things final. And so that's first what the confirmation depth is. Um, but you can, if you can imagine, like for example, for Bitcoin, if we set the confirmation depth to six, it's going to slow down the game massively. Like we can't say, okay, like user submit a transaction on Xi here, but now to wait for whatever might happen on Bitcoin, we have to wait a few hours. Like that's not acceptable, right? So we want to update the game right away, despite you know potentially a long confirmation depth, and uh, that's basically what this delay is. So the delay uh, offsets the timestamps you're comparing for the parallel chain, right? So instead of comparing what's happening on Bitcoin right now and what's happening on Bitcoin in the next few seconds, you shift all this over to the left. So instead of saying, okay, we consider what's happening right now, we say, okay, let's consider what happened a few hours ago. And so you can see here, like for example, this graph, instead of comparing really similar timestamps that happened one after each other, we shift this all the way back. So we're comparing timestamps that happened hours ago. And so this delay parameter 
of course causes a slowdown on how fast actions happening in these parallel chains updating your game but it does not slow down your game itself for example if you're deploying your game to Xi, anything that happens on the Xi chain itself will appear in your game right away it's just thing that happens in other chains that you might be wondering that might be delayed and so you can see here we kind of shift everything down uh, for example here by minute and compare the timestamps of uh, a minute ago so you say okay if we are at block at timestamp 63 on xi we're now looking at what happened in parallel chain at timestamp number two uh, and so this helps avoid um, this kind of desynchronization or avoid this kind of um, delay inside your game uh, and allows you to have many parallel chains for application without slowing down your core experience on Psy itself. And so this does have performance implications, uh, but we've um, you know done our best to address these in a whole variety of ways so that you can build your game, you build your application, leveraging all these different stacks. There are some um, chain specific constraints to this. So as I mentioned, we support uh, many blockchains, not just EVM, uh, but every blockchain comes with its own kind of uh, trick for this. Uh, so for example, if you launch parallel EVM funnels, uh, we describe some of these like extra uh, things that go behind the hood, which is like, how do we gather these timestamps? How do we um, get these timestamps efficiently? And this includes like binary searches and so on. And so there's some ex extra tricks that go on behind the scenes that I haven't uh, you know, entirely described to you. Uh, but hopefully this gives you an idea of, of how we're using parallel funnels um, for Pyme Engine. And these are not just theoretical uh, capabilities that might come in the future. This is something that we've actually shipped to mainnet already and started a game called Tarochi, which is this decentralized RPG game. So inside this game, you can already play this game from Psy, but using NFTs or uh, tokens from Arbitrum or Cardano and have all these players play in a single unified gaming experience. So people who are playing on different chains can join guilds together, they can battle each other, they can compete for the same uh, resources. And so all that has been made possible by uh, the many months of work that we have put into this a parallel funnel system. And uh, you know, the reason we've put so much work into it is because we really think that modularity is the future. Um, and to really leverage the modular stack, we really need a decentralized uh, rollout framework that's optimized for gaming. And that's what Pyme Engine is meant to be. So hopefully that helped you understand all the work we've been uh, doing behind the uh, scenes to make experiences like Toroshi possible and any other game and application built using Pyme Engine coming up. So thank you so much for your time. And we're going to keep building and keep adding a lot more stuff. So definitely uh, stay in touch.